All right. It's a quality crowd, right? That's right. Y'all are great. Uh, well, I uh, thinking about this Sunday being uh, the Sunday before Easter. I'm just so excited to preach about the crucifixion today. And as uh, they were sharing about um, this being Palm Sunday and and those that um, welcome Jesus into Jerusalem with s shouting and celebration, uh, very shortly they were mocking him and crucifying him. And so today I wanted to just spend some time talking about the crucifixion of Christ. And uh, yeah, I'd like to ask you all to, if you have your Bibles, uh, get them out. If you don't, get it, they're in the back. Um, All right. Thank you, Lord. Let me pray for us. And uh, uh, oh, turn to John. I'll tell you what. Turn to John chapter nineteen. That's going to be at the very end. Yeah. The other one, I've got a bunch of other ones that are going to be hard for you to turn, look to, but we've got, we'll put, put it up on the screen for you to follow. And uh, today, I, I just want to ask you to just pay close attention. I, I'm asking for God to raise up your faith today uh, as we talk about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So, let me pray for us. Father, as we bow before you, as we think about the significance of what you did for us, as we look to this Friday at representing the, the day you hung on the cross, Lord, um, give us an ability this morning to grasp the significance of what you've done for us, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. amen. The message of the cross, together with the birth and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, is the most important message in the history of the world. The message of the cross, together with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and his resurrection, the birth and resurrection, is the most important message in the history of this world. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ was the culmination of God's plan to save us from the devastating consequences of our sin. Amen? Amen. Now, listen to this, because a lot of you are so new in your faith, and I want you to understand how historical this death of Jesus actually was. The foretelling of this plan began as God chose a tribe of people thousands of years ago through whom he would bring the Savior of the world. These people with this rich history, as most of all of you know, are the Jewish people. The Old Testament tells their history as they live out the role of God's chosen people. The Old Testament, written over a period of over a thousand years, with an oral tradition that preceded that possibly of 800 years, 
foretells in a veiled way the coming of Jesus Christ to die for our sins. The Old Testament is said to be the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is said to be the Old Testament revealed. Did you get that? The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. I want to ask you to look with me at three ancient Old Testament events that point clearly to the substitutionary sacrifice accomplished by the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That word substitution means he died for you. He died in your place. On behalf of you, he took what you deserved upon himself. His sacrifice that was accomplished by the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So first, let's look at an event that happened around 1,400 years before Christ. When Israel had been enslaved by Egypt for over 400 years. This was to be the last of the ten plagues that God sent to Egypt in order to free his people. In Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, starting with verse 3. How many of y'all ever saw the, the movie, uh, the Exodus, the movie of the people of, of Israel leaving Egypt after being slaves for 430 years? You remember the plagues? How many of y'all remember the plagues? <clears throat> there were 10 plagues that God sent to this mighty nation of Egypt to get Israel to be set free. And so we're going to look about the 10th plague in Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. God says this to Israel. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. And then in verse 6, it says, Take care of him until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. And then look at verse 12. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And then up on the screen, I hope it says, Exodus 12, 13. There it is. Look what it says. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. You see, the people then and we are hopelessly in bondage to a greater power. That great power, that great force was the nation of Egypt as Israel had been slaves for 430 years. But there was a greater power that held them in bondage. It was their own sin and the force behind their sin. Jesus called the prince of this world, the God of this world, Satan. You see, the people were and we are hopelessly in bondage to that greater power. They were until God delivered them. And I want you to notice, it was the blood of a lamb that saved them. Look again at verse 13. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, can y'all say the blood? blood? I will pass over you and no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. I want you to notice that in verse 7, he told them to put the blood of this innocent lamb 
on the top of the doorpost and on the two sides. As I see that blood dripping down from the top, I think of the cross. A foretelling of the blood of an innocent lamb that will bring about the deliverance and the salvation of people in bondage. The blood of the lamb saved them. The sacrifice involving lambs became a daily sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem. From then on, every morning and evening, a lamb was sacrificed in the temple for the sins of the people. The Old Testament prophets Jeremiah and Isaiah foretold the coming of one who would sacri whose sacrifice would provide redemption for those who believe. He was called like a lamb led to the slaughter. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7, it says, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before her shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. Isaiah wrote that 500 years before Jesus even came. John the Baptist recognized Jesus. In John chapter 1, verse 29, when Jesus walked up, John had been baptizing people into repentance, looking for the coming Messiah. And look at what John said in John chapter 1, verse 29. He said, look, it's the Lamb. Would you all say Lamb? lamb. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus was crucified over the time of the Passover celebration. In fact, as they prepared for the Lord's Supper, it was a preparation for the Passover. He was crucified on the Passover, the day that the Jews recognized the lamb that was slain and the deliverance of the people of Israel. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know he is the Lamb of God, slain from the foundations of the world. Peter wrote it like this in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in the last times for your sake. Can you receive that today? For your sake, for your sake, for your sake. Hallelujah for the lamb that was slain for the foundations of the world. Can you all say amen? amen? The Passover holiday, holy day, is still celebrated to this day by the Jewish people. But Jesus is that Passover lamb. Now let's look at another frightening Old Testament event. It's in Numbers 21, verses 4 through 9. And you can go ahead and put up the, the little thing that I... Had, but in Numbers chapter 21, the people had been delivered from Egypt. They had been set free. But you know, how many of you know you can take a person out of Egypt, but it's really hard to take the Egypt out of the person? How many of you know that? <laughs> you can get them out of that situation. But you can't get the situation out of what's inside of them. And so here the people had been delivered from Egypt. They had been provided for by the hand of Almighty God. But guess what? They still weren't satisfied. They began to grumble. They began to complain. They began to long for their life back in Egypt. God over and over and over again forgave them until in Numbers chapter 21, verse 4, it says, They traveled from Mount Or along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses 
and said, why have you brought us out of Egypt? To die in the desert? How many of you know what it's like to forget what it's like in Egypt? What it's like in that old life? And all you remember are the good times, the party times, the times that you were relieved of the pressures of this life. And you say, why did you take me out of there just to put me in all these trials? They begin to whine and complain. Now look what it says. It says, there is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. God had provided manna from heaven. He provided water in the desert. But none of it after a while was good enough even though it was miraculously supplied. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, Okay, we sinned. We spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Take a snake. Put it up on a pole. Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. And when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. You see, the people were and we are hopelessly defiant and discontent. Amen? If there's something to complain about, we're going to find it, aren't we? If there's something to be dissatisfied about, we're going to find it, aren't we? Something about our fallen nature just searches like a radar to find something to be dissatisfied about. It's our fallen nature, and we can't help ourselves. We're hopelessly defiant and discontent, just like the people of Israel. You see, this event was the culmination of God repeatedly providing for and delivering his people, yet they were unable to change. They were bitten, all right. They were bitten by sin. The poison of sin had infected them. That infection was passed down generation to generation to generation. It was a poison that separated them from God and set them on a path of defiance and independence from God. And there was no cure. Jeremiah says the heart is desperately wicked and beyond cure. Who can know the heart of man? They needed to be delivered from the power of sin. And this event was a foreshadowing of a much greater event that was to come. Notice what he said. He said, put a, make a snake and put it up on a pole. And if the people who are bitten by the serpent will look up to that snake on the pole, they will be healed of the poison. That poison will be transferred from them all the way to that snake on the pole and they will be healed. Jesus Christ said this in the book of John, chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Listen to what Jesus says. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert. So Jesus is referring to this ancient event. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert. This was Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. Knowing what he was going to do. He said just as Moses lifted up that snake in Numbers 21. So the Son of Man must be lifted up. And here's the good news. So that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. 
the poison that we've all been bitten with, that we cannot cure in our own strength or determination or good intention. That poison of sin Jesus took upon himself on the cross. And he said, anyone who looks to me in faith, that poison will be taken out of you and placed upon the Savior of the world. Now let's look at another frightening. <laughs> let's look at another amazing, let's just put it that way, another amazing foretelling of the Christ in the book of Leviticus. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, You ever heard the phrase scapegoat? How many of you ever heard the phrase a scapegoat? How many of you ever felt like you were the scapegoat? A lot of times. Everybody got off scot-free because they blamed it on you. <laughs> I'm going to tell you where that scapegoat word came from today. In Leviticus chapter 16, verse 3. The Lord spoke to Aaron and he said, this is how Aaron is to enter the sanctuary area with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. From the verse five, from the Israelite community. He is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Look at verse seven. Then he is to take the two goats, and present them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. There it is, the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. I guess he lost the lot, didn't he? He, he lost the bet. But the goat chosen by Lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the desert as a scapegoat. When Aaron has finished, verse 20, when Aaron has finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. He is to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send the goat away into the desert in the care of a man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place and the man shall release it in the desert. You see, the people and we are hopelessly mired in our conscious and unconscious sin. And they and we needed a scapegoat who would carry our sins away. Isaiah 53, 6 states, All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him. I want you to picture that priest with his hands laying that hand, those hands on the goat, confessing all the sins of Israel. Sins of commission, sins of omission, conscious sin, unconscious sin. Laying the hands in and putting that sin upon that goat. And then by the instruction of Almighty God, that goat was to be taken out and released into the wilderness. Those sins to be taken upon that scapegoat. And the people declared not guilty. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who had no sin 
to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. I want you to see these three foretellings, foreshadowings of the death of Jesus Christ. My hope is that it'll make it so much more meaningful for you. Perhaps it'll build your faith to a point where you realize that Almighty God had you in his mind before the foundations of the world. He chose a people through whom he would bring the Savior of the world, the Messiah, and played out this reality over a period of thousands of years and brought it to its culmination at the cross because he loved you that much. I want you to read with me. John chapter 19, starting with the last part of verse 16. And we're going to read about the crucifixion of Jesus. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him with two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one place from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened so that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved, that was John, standing there at the foot of the cross watching this happen. Jesus looked to mom. To, Jesus looked to John standing nearby and he said to his mother, Dear woman, there, here is your son. And to the disciple, John here is your mother. In other words, take care of my mother. From that time on, his disciple took her into his home. Look at verse 28. Later, knowing that all was completed so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put a sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Even that was a prophecy out of Exodus 20, 12, 22. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Three words, It is is finished he accomplished it all that was prophesied for thousands of years he was the literal fulfillment he was the Passover lamb he was the one lifted up on that pole to take the sins of the world Hallelujah. Today, what about you? 
I want to ask you, what about you? Have you lived in the bondage of your sin? Have you lived being controlled by the prince of this world until life has become hopelessly under his control? No matter how hard you will it, you cannot change. Have you lived and are you living in a place where in your flesh and in your own strength you find yourself hopelessly defiant and discontent? Have you lived and are you living hopelessly mired in your conscious and unconscious sin driving your life? I want you to know he came to deliver us from the power of sin, from the penalty of sin, from the consequences of our sin. He became our scapegoat to take away our sin. When you think about that crucifixion this Friday, I want you to realize it was the greatest moment in history until the resurrection, which we're going to talk about next Sunday. And I want you to personalize it. I want you to see that the precious Lamb of God became full of venom, the venom of everyone's sin on that cross. That precious Lamb of God had the sins of the world, yours included, laid upon his head and took those sins away as the scapegoat. And I want you to fall down and worship Jesus Christ because one day we're all going to be rejoicing with him together forever. Amen? Amen. Would you all stand? I want to ask you to bow your heads. I'm going to ask uh, Sabi and Jared to come forward. Paul, uh, any of the elders that are here, if you would come forward.